Today's video is all about remote sensing, and this is going to be a brief overview of the concepts in remote sensing that we want you to understand for our particular course. Our first objective is to understand the relationship between wavelength and frequency. Second, we're going to ask you to calculate the wavelength of maximum emission from an object using Wien's Law. Third, you're going to know all about atmospheric windows, what they are, why they're important, and why they help us in determining what payloads we should choose. Third, or fourth rather, you should understand what swath width and resolution are and how they're going to be used to determine our altitude range given a set of requirements. So to begin with, let's look at a satellite and talk about what remote sensing actually is in this context. Well, as you might imagine, remote sensing is detecting from afar. So oftentimes we might see a satellite that's up orbiting the Earth, looking down at the Earth. It might be equipped, in this case, with a visible camera. And that visible camera is going to be used to take pictures of the Earth. Here's an example of what a picture might look like. So this actual image is taken from a QuickBird satellite, and it's looking down at Rome, at St. Peter's Basilica. And what you can actually see is a surprising amount of, of details. You not only see large buildings and structures, and you can even see shadows and the height maybe, or infer the heights of those structures using our shadow length, but you can also see actually cars. And you might even be able to determine that this is a car and this is a bus because it looks longer. You can even see boats on the water. You can see down here with the, the wake of that boat, you might even be able to tell how fast and in what direction that boat might be traveling. You can see vegetation and the health of that vegetation. So all of that type of information is very useful for us in terms of military intelligence and so we can build a large picture there. But what we're looking at since we have a visible band camera is only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum actually goes from very very small things, short wavelengths, to very very long wavelengths out here in terms of radio. And all of this energy is really kind of the same stuff. It's traveling at the same speed. It's traveling at the speed of light. And so depending on where we have our sensor, we can actually detect or see different things. So when we were looking at the uh, visible image before, uh, we can actually see boats and trees and whatnot. But it turns out if we were to look in a different part of the spectrum, we might even garner more information. So for instance, here's a man holding some ha his hands up underneath the bag, and we might want to know how many fingers is he holding up underneath that bag. And if we're just looking in the visible spectrum, we're just guessing. But if we use an infrared camera, we can actually see that he's got all of his fingers up here. And so that might be an important uh, bit of information that we could exploit. However, we do lose some information. So while we can see how many fingers he has up underneath his bag, we can't see where his eyes are looking. Um, and so that might be something that we would uh, trade for our particular ex uh, particular experiment. So um, every object that's above absolute zero actually emits um, some sort of radiation. That radiation is going to follow the shape of a curve that we call the Planckian. Um, our sun is at 5,778 degrees Kelvin. So when we look at, at a visible band image, what we're really looking at is reflected sunlight off of multiple different surfaces. And so that particular uh, energy is going to have a peak uh, related to its temperature. And that's exactly what Wien's Law is. So the relationship between temperature and the peak wavelength emission is going to be lambda max equals 2898 divided by T, wherein our lambda max is our peak wavelength emission and T is given to us in terms of Kelvin and uh, in terms of temperature. So not all parts of our atmosphere are completely transparent to all types of, of the EUM spectrum. In fact, uh, what we do see is that our atmosphere is almost completely um, opaque to things like UV radiation, which is great because uh, that's why we don't get terribly sunburned uh, from all of those terrible uh, UV rays that come down through. Some do make it through, um, and those are getting closer to the uh, visible portion of the spectrum. So the visible portion of the EM spectrum can actually make it completely through our atmosphere. And some uh, parts of the um, uh, EM spectrum can make it partially through the uh, EM spectrum. Some of it is attenuated it out. And so what this helps us do is to determine um, if we're looking down at the surface of the earth, we need to make sure that there's an atmospheric window that we can see through the atmosphere because otherwise we're going to be a situation where kind of like the, the uh, looking at the, the man's eyes behind his glasses, we're going to be uh, out of luck trying to see where he's looking if we're looking down from space looking at a portion of the uh, EM spectrum that's completely opaque to us. If we're looking at space objects from space, then it's actually less important for us to know what these atmospheric windows are. Next, we're going to talk briefly about a relationship between frequency and wavelength. So frequency is the number of cycles per second of our particular energy, and wavelength is going to be the length of one cycle, measured from peak to peak. Uh, 
So we can build up a relationship to that using the fact that all of that energy is going to be traveling at the same speed. And that speed is going to be c, or the speed of light. So wavelength is equal to c divided by our frequency, where speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And all of that you should find on your equation sheet. All right, so let's talk about some remote sensing properties. So in general, uh, we actually have some geometry that's going to govern how much of the Earth we see and where we see it. So the first is to look at our field of view. So if we're a satellite and we're looking down from orbit onto the ground, we have a field of view that's going to be governed by our swath width and our particular altitude. So our altitude and our field of view are going to govern our swath width, or alternatively, our swath width and field of view is going to determine our altitude. But these three things are going to be in a relationship with one another. And they're related to how our actual optics are established. So here we have essentially a space telescope looking down at the Earth. We have incoming light that's reflected off a mirror, a primary mirror, and then reflected off a secondary mirror out to a detector. We have a particular focal length that's set up by the length of our uh, actual telescope here and a field of view which is going to represent how much of the Earth that we can actually see and a detector which is RD that's set up here as this red little block. Then we lastly have an aperture diameter which is how large of a telescope optic do we really have. So here's the uh, actual equation that you'll see on your equation sheet. So our swath width is related to the radius of the detector times the height divided by our focal length all of that multiplied by 2. Um, and our field of view is equal to 2 times the inverse tangent of the radius of the detector divided by our focal length. That's going to determine our swath width. So what does swath width look like in practice? So here is a particular swath width, and here is an increased swath width. So there's obvious value and utility in having a larger swath width because we can see more of the Earth underneath us. However, we end up usually trading swath width for resolution. So here's an example of what resolution looks like. So you may not be able to tell what this image is just with a kind of poor resolution. But you can kind of see some green stuff here and some green stuff there. So maybe, maybe this is a grassy park. And as I increase the resolution, it becomes increasingly clear what I'm looking at. Oh, no. We all know what this is, right? And if you zoom in, you can actually even see people on the Tizo here. And uh, you might be able to see with the, uh, how tall this thing is with a shadow, right? So what, what, how, how long it is. So resolution is going to be how fine of details that we can see. So an increased resolution is actually a smaller number. So resolution is equal to 2.44 times our wavelength times our height or our altitude uh, divided by the aperture diameter. So that's the equation that you'll see. So increased resolution is usually helpful for us, but we're oftentimes trading that for swath width. So let's talk about a little bit about what those trades would be uh, in terms of our mission altitude for a particular experiment. This is exactly what you're going to have to do on your design project. So our resolution is going to limit your max altitude. So you're going to have a resolution number that you have to achieve, and that's going to govern how high up you can really be above the surface of the Earth. However, you're also going to have a swath width um, number that you're going to have to achieve. And that swath width is going to govern your minimum altitude. So your sweet spot of acceptable altitudes would be somewhere in this range. However, there's one more relationship that we can talk about, and that is related to our uh, wavelength itself, which we'll see in just a second. So our swath width, how do we improve that? We can either increase our altitude, or if we want to change our camera, we can increase the radius of the detector or decrease our focal length. And if we have a given resolution and we want to increase it, we could either decrease our orbital altitude, or it could increase my aperture diameter, or I could change my subject uh, wavelength. So the thing that I'm trying to look at, the particular wavelength, I can actually change that, and that's going to change what my resolution is. And notably, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but a decreased resolution is actually a good thing, if that makes sense. So hopefully from today's video, you've learned uh, some about these concepts. We talked about wavelength and frequency. We talked about Wien's Law. We talked about atmospheric windows and how it relates to our payload selection. And lastly, we talked about trading swath width and resolution and how that can help us pick our uh, altitude. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. When things get hot,
kind of related to that. When things get hot, they start to give off heat if they get or heat. <laughs> they give off light <laughs> if they're hot enough. Right. So if you're three year old, three year old me and you see a red hot orange stove top, and you you touch it, you get burned. I don't recommend doing that. But that was my first encounter with Vine's Law. I guess it's not Ween's Law. Someone corrected me and it's Vine's Law. So Vine's Law. Glad I know how to say it now. But Vine's Law says when things get hot enough to emit light, uh, whether that's the sun or a red hot stovetop or something reentering the atmosphere like a meteor, things that start to heat up enough to emit light will, will emit an amount of light that is the most. What do I mean by that? Well, take the sun, for example. The sun emits almost every you know, frequency of radio <clears throat> energy all the way up through gamma rays. And it's emitting that all the time, like it is not selective. But there are certain amounts of the EM spectrum that are emitting more than others from the sun. So, for example, the sun is, we would probably, most of us would say yellow. Um, it turns out when you get out beyond the atmosphere that's scattering out the green, the sun has a greenish yellow tint, um, which is kind of interesting to me. Like I always think of the sun as that soft yellow, but it's, it's not really when there's no atmosphere in the way it's like a yellow green. Um, but what that's saying is, Per, per Vine's law, per this law, the sun has a peak, like a most amount of emission in the yellow-green part of the visible spectrum. So basically, based on how hot it is, based on the temp of the sun, at that temperature, uh, things emit in the yellow-green, evidently, right? So the max, the amount of, the, the amount of light that is the most prominent coming from that hot object that wavelength is in the yellow green. That's what Vine's law is trying to say. It's like, you know, um, or for example, the, the hot stovetop is emitting in the red orange like wavelength. I don't know exactly what that is. I was too busy with my finger being burned, but you've all seen it before when that stovetop gets super hot, it starts to emit mostly it's emitting in lots of different lights, but the, the, the part of the EM spectrum that's the most prominent that your eyes are picking up is orange per Vine's law. So, as a heads up, wavelengths often get measured in micrometers, which is times 10 to the negative six of a meter. And temperatures are measured in, in kelvins. And that's gonna be pretty much throughout the, the whole course. But okay. So let's dig in a little more to remote sensing per se. So how does a camera work? Well, actually, I'm not that familiar with how cameras work. I, uh, I own an old Sony digital camera because back when I was a cadet, if you wanted to take a picture of something, you actually needed a camera to do that. And it was like, a, it was like a really fire gift from, you know, a family member to get a, a little digital camera. Cause then you could go places and take pictures of stuff. Cause why? Well, the flip phone that I had did have a camera and it was like, what, three pixels by three pixels resolution it was terrible. <clears throat> and so, uh, having an actual camera was, was the business man. It was just the biz. And so, yeah, light comes in, goes through this lens and hits this, back plate that's full of little tiny squares of material that can detect if a photon hits it called CCDs, charge couple devices. Really, really cool. Like that's the fundamental of a digital camera. I mean, back in the days of film, this was actually an exposed piece of film, right? So like you would, you know, the lens would, or the shutter would open temporarily and let some photons through and that would expose the, the film. So anyway, but digital cameras don't do that. However, all of them have kind of the similar properties here. So let's say this is our satellite with the camera inside. We can even give it, oh, those are really pitifully small solar panels, but whatever. Sorry, little satellite. It's got this big old camera inside. Okay, there's a few definitions we need to actually get out of the way. So the first is focal length. So the distance between where it enters the lens and where it hits the back plate is this thing called focal length. So focal length, like a longer focal length has yeah, effects on your camera. Again, like I'm not an optics guy by trade, but uh, it can affect how, how your camera takes pictures. Obviously the longer your focal length is, the longer your satellite has to be to try and fit all that in there. Um, and another thing you have to kind of care about is the diameter of this aperture, right? And so if you were ever a kid like me, you would get a straw, you know, for your drinking McDonald's and like hold it up your eye and like look through it. Like, oh, it's like a little tiny 
little tiny slice of the world you can see through a soda straw versus if you did the same thing, I guess I was a goofy kid, but like with a, a roll of uh, wrapping paper, once it's done, after you're done like sword fighting your brother with it, um, which is fun, you look through it and you can see like a bigger soda straw, right? So the, the width of the soda straw end to end is the diameter of the aperture. And that actually matters a lot, right? Because like if you have a little tiny aperture, like the McDonald's soda straw, you can only see a <clears throat> small slice of the earth. And maybe you want to see more than a tiny slice of the earth, man. Like you launch a satellite to space, you probably want to see a lot. So how big that aperture is, um, is what allows uh, photons to come through. And so you, you want lots of photons. And then the last thing that you guys intuitively know is the distance between the target that you're trying to take a picture of and the camera. Like, and in our case, that distance has a special name. It's actually the altitude of the satellite above the ground, right? H. H for altitude or height. It's not the same as centimeter axis, right? Because centimeter axis starts way at the bottom of the earth. And this, this is a perennial issue that trips people up in astro. I don't want it to trip you guys up. Height is measured from the surface of the earth. Some major axis is measured from, you know, way below the surface, right from the middle of the earth. Okay. So those are some kind of property cameras that we're going to give you in the design project. Like, hey, camera one has a focal length of this and an image plane of this and a field of view of this. Um, and I've got a slide here for field of view, so I'll show you that in a second. But you're going to need to see which of those properties works best for you for the mission that we have and for the altitude that you pick. So here as a good segue, are some parameters that you have to take into account. The customer in the design project and the customer in the real world will say, look, I wanna see an amount of the earth that is X kilometers, however many kilometers across. And that term is known as swath width. So for example, let's look at our USAFA North Korea picture. Just kidding. I don't know exactly off the top of my head what the swath distance would be from you know, end to end here. Or, and you, you never know exactly at which angle the picture was taken, but roughly the distance here across this picture on the ground, what would that be like? That's over by almost lower two dig, all the way over to that hill. Oh, I don't know. Could we say it's a kilometer? Probably. Let's round it up to a gentleman's kilometer. That's basically what this is saying. Is like this image covers however much ground on the actual ground. It's about one kilometer. So the swath width of this picture would be one kilometer. And if you could have your druthers, you'd probably want a very big swath width so you didn't have to take a whole bunch of pictures, right? But not all cameras have a huge swath width. So a way you can kind of know that is this metric called field of view. Field of view, you might say to yourself, well, shouldn't field of view be this angle between here and here? And it's actually, it's actually not. It's the angle between basically the edges of what the camera is able to see. So swath width is actually a linear distance, like X amount of kilometers. Field of view is an angle. In the equation itself, this spits out radians. Um, and so you have to convert it to degrees if you want it to not seem like an insanely small number. All right, so again, swath width is that distance on the ground, linear distance that an image covers. And then field of view is the angular kind of way of describing that, like what's the width of that cone angularly end to end in radians and then you convert it to degrees. And again, this is stuff that the customer in the design project is gonna say, look, I want a swath width of at least this big, right? I want a swath width of at least, you know, however many kilometers, uh, I was gonna say big, we'll say wide. Bigger is okay. 
And then a field of view is actually a property of the camera. It doesn't change. Okay, see how all that ties in here. Okay. Next thing is resolution that we're going to talk about. And this I really want to pause on and make a distinction between how usually people think about resolution as far as cameras go and how the space bubbas think about resolution, which is somewhat different. So in the commercial world, in the civilian world, you know, you go to the Verizon store, or the AT&T store, or if anyone has that anymore, or Sprint, whatever. You go to the phone store and you're looking for a new phone. Um, and the dude sidles up to you. He's like, well, I don't know if you've seen the Samsung galaxy note extra plus mega seven i don't know what they're called it's got a it's got a 17 megapixel camera and you're like okay well that sounds like a lot of pixels but what he's describing is basically how how precise is that charged couple detector he's like how many little ccds did we squish into that back plate for the phone camera <clears throat> in the business we don't really think about it like that we think about it resolution as I'm going to try and write it here and I'll explain it. We think about resolution as the distance between two objects. I should say the smallest distance between two objects. That can be resolved. as distinct which is to say two separate things all right so check this out in this picture of what i think is a stadium maybe one of you guys knows which actual stadium this is i don't off the top of my head this lower picture here um i can tell there's a huge building there and a you know and many buildings adjacent to it that are attached what are some of the smallest things that i can pick out with my eyes well let's see i can see down here these little hashes look like cars. And if you zoom in, like I can tell that those two cars are two separate things. But let's see, like I don't know what this is. Those objects start to blend together into one blob. So you're like, okay, the resolution, the resolution of this picture looks like whatever this distance is, I can at least resolve those two objects are the same thing. It's probably like, or sorry, there's two separate things. And so I can probably say this is a resolution of like it's between one and two meters, right? So in the business, there is actually a, you know, a mathematical way to describe this. But for you guys, I just want you to understand the concept. Resolution is not what you think it is when you go to the Apple store or the iPhone store um, where you're describing a number of how, how many pixels are crammed into an image. It's, it's not that way for resolution for images we take from space. And this is where I go to my Maxar example. See how they say that, hey, Maxar is not offering you imagery that's 10 million megapixels. They're saying introducing 15 centimeter HD. What does that mean? Well, what they're saying, let's look at the example they give. Looks like there's a whole bunch of ships in port here. And you can just about tell if, if there were basically, would you say, tennis balls lined up on the deck, you could tell that each tennis ball was an individual thing. There's not. There's little, like, hash marks on this deck. Looks like a helipad on the back of a ship. I wonder if it says where this is. Well, that would be interesting, but they just give an example. Okay. Anyway, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is in the business of uh, satellite imagery, the way we describe resolution is in little distances, right? And smaller is going to be better for that. So let's go back to the... Oops, go back to my slide deck. Smaller resolutions are better. So resolutions in the sat satellite world are, are like golf. You want the smallest score to win. Okay, keep pressing here. So what are the knobs you can actually turn to make your resolution better? Well, just like a camera on Earth, if you're taking picture of somebody down the hallway during a hall brawl the closer you get to the person the better the picture is going to be um, and in the satcom not satcom in the satellite world that's the same as decreasing the altitude of your satellite and really you're not going to have the option to do that on orbit you need to choose the altitude that's low enough or high enough before you launch and then launch into that altitude right 
Um, and then also you could just get a better camera, right? Like that's that increase the aperture diameter, take in more pixels, have a more dense CCD um, array, stuff like that. Uh, and then you could also change the wavelength you're trying to sense at. So a lot of cameras will say, look, our camera can detect between, and I'm making this up, but like, for example, 0.1 micrometers all the way up to two micrometers. And just the way that the camera is built, any wavelengths outside of that will start to not give you as good of a picture, right? It'll be degraded. You'll start to lose colors that you expect. Um, and so you want to make sure you're sensing and, you know, objects are emitting light or reflecting light in that range if you're going to use that camera, right? And so that's a big bugaboo with the design project because the customer says, I want this resolution, X resolution, and I'm, I'm going to give you four camera options. And those cameras have different ranges of min and max wavelengths. And some are going to work and some are not. So you have to, you have to check. And then when it comes to swath width, really the best way to, to improve swath width is to get farther from the earth, right? For swath width, bigger is better. Customer's gonna say, I want at least a certain swath width. So bigger is fine, but you can't have any smaller. So, okay. These next couple of slides, these next three precisely slides, I made to get you started on the design project and the homeworks. So, like I said, a camera <coughs> manufacturer and also the design project handout is going to say, my camera can only detect a minimum wavelength of bleh, however many micrometers, right? That's actually going to drive how high you are allowed to launch your satellite and still catch that wavelength. Meaning, if I were to put my satellite up here, it would not be able to pick up. Let's say the let's say the minimum wavelength was 0.1 micrometer, like I gave you in my little example. If you fly any higher than this yellow line, you're going to lose that wavelength. Your camera is no longer capable of being that far away and catching that. And so what you do is you take your resolution equation and reverse engineer it for that height. You sub in the customer's resolution that they want. You sub in the minimum wavelength. And that will spit out a height. And as a quick side note, uh, let's see. Let me actually bring up where's my equation sheet. We're on the front page of the equation sheet, in kind of the upper right side under remote sensing payloads. There's your field of view equation resolution. So what I'm trying to say with you know, minimum wavelength and max wavelength is this. Um, This equation right here is what you're going to reverse engineer to get a height. So the max height that you're that you can fly your satellite at and still catch all the wavelengths you need to catch. Let me shrink this a little bit. Is going to be driven by resolution and minimum wavelength. Okay. On the lower end of things, you have kind of two limitations, um, and they're both their swath width and resolution max. And for the max, oh, sorry, max uh, wavelength, you're gonna do the same thing. Reverse engineer resolution equation for height. You're gonna put in wavelength max and the customer's desired resolution. I apologize for my penmanship. Okay, so there'll be a height at which uh, lower than that, you're not going to be able to pick up the max wavelength of the camera. And also, swath width is going to drive some restrictions here. So the customer, like I said, is going to say, hey, I want a certain 
width of the earth for each snapshot that you take. And if it's any smaller than that, I'm not going to buy your satellite constellation. So you're like, oh, I, I do want you to buy my constellation. So um, what you want to do is take, for swath width, you'll take the customer's desired swath width that they give you. And you will reverse engineer the swath width equation to get a height out of that. I really meant that to be an arrow, but I don't think that turned out so hot. Boop. There we go. So, <laughs> what am I getting? Well, once you have both those values, you'll have kind of a ceiling and a floor within which any altitude is okay. You'll be catching enough of the earth with a swath width and enough of the earth, um, or rather you'll be high enough to catch all the wavelengths and not so high that you're losing color and losing detail. So anyway, that's what you're going to do for the design project. Um, and I'm just going to give you a resolution for the design project. I'm going to say I think you should have less than three meters. That's me, the customer, basically giving you a resolution. We'll go over it again on Friday. But okay, I'm just about out of time. And that's good because I'm straight up out of slides.